Okay, um, I guess if you are ready, we can start. Um, so, hi everyone, welcome to our EC seminar at UT Austin. Today is my great pleasure to introduce Stephanie Jagielka from MIT. Stephanie is an associate professor in the department of ECS, and she's also a member of the Computer Science and AI Lab, also known as CSET. Before joining MIT, she was a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley, and she obtained her PhD from ETH Zurich and the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. Stephanie has received several awards, including a Sloan Research Fellowship, an NSF Career Award, a DARPA Young Faculty Award, the German Pattern Recognition Award, and a Best Paper Award at ICML. Her research interests span the theory and practice of algorithmic machine learning, including discrete and continuous optimization, discrete probability, and learning with structured data. And today she's going to talk about representation and learning in graph neural networks. With that, I pass it to Stephanie. Thanks a lot, Aryan, for the introduction, and um, thank you all for the invitation. It's nice to be back. I wish I was there in person, but at least <laughs> um, remotely. So yeah, today I'll talk about um, representation and learning in graph neural networks. So basically a summary of some of our recent work on graph representation learning. So to sort of set the stage and motivate all of this a little bit, let me just review a few problems where you may actually want to do learning with graphs. So the first one is an example where you, your input is a graph. And given the graph, you would like to predict something, something. So for example, the graph could be a molecule and you'd like to predict properties such as solubility, toxicity, or whether this would work as say a COVID drug. So here you need basically a good representation of that molecule. And you have, you know something about the nodes, which are the atoms. So you have some features of the nodes and possibly features of the edges too. So another example is that I don't want a prediction from the full graph, but just from a node in the graph. So for example, in a social network, I'd like to predict some properties of a person in that network. And essentially the idea is that given the neighborhood of that person, I would be able to tell something about that person. Um, so here, what I really want is a representation of the node or a neighborhood of the node in the graph. Another problem is that I'm trying to predict edges in the graph. So in this particular example that's illustrated here, I have a network of drugs and of proteins in the body. And there's an edge whenever, so between two drugs, there's an edge if the drugs have adverse side effects, if you take them together. So for example, if I take drug A and B by themselves, I don't have any side effects, but if I take them together, I actually have a reaction sort of between them and I get a side effect. And now what you're trying to predict is whether you would have that side effect and what kind of side effect. So that would be the link in that network. And likewise, you also have links between um, proteins and drugs whenever the drug interacts with a protein. So here the idea is that you'd like to given a pair of nodes, essentially you'd like to predict whether there is a connection or not and what kind of connection. So really trying to find a representation of an edge in a graph. And a final application is recommender systems where we really have a bipartite graph where on one side you have users and on the other side you have items that the users can choose. And when you know that the user has chosen an item, you'd like to predict whether the user would like another item. So you're basically trying to find similar items to recommend to the user. So you're trying to predict from a node to another node on the other side. So in all of these problems, these are basically problems where we have an input graph and we know something about the nodes in that graph, maybe about the edges. And we are trying to find a good encoding either of the nodes or of the entire graph such that we retain the information we have about the nodes but also capture some of the structural properties of the graphs, especially the neighborhoods of the nodes. And a recently popular way to do this have been graph neural networks and they essentially do both together. So they do node embeddings and graph embeddings. And since I don't know how familiar you are with that, let me just review what is a graph neural network, what's the main idea. And there's several ways of doing it. The, one of the most popular ones is a message passing architecture that we'll see here. So the idea is as follows. 
each node has a feature. So the input feature could be, for example, the atom type of my atoms in the molecule. And now we will first learn a representation for each node. And we'll do this iteratively. So in each iteration, a node collects the information from its neighbors, meaning the feature vectors of its neighbors, and updates its representation based on that. And then um, you do this for several rounds. And after that, you basically combine all the node embeddings. And since basically every node is doing that, in the second round, you're not only collecting information from your neighbor, but also from your neighbor two hops away. And in three steps, it gets a larger neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. So basically over the rounds, you collect information from a larger and larger neighborhood of your graph. And what you're actually learning in this essentially algorithm is how do you aggregate the information from the neighbors? So this is typically also called the aggregation function. So basically the input for that aggregation function is the feature vectors of all the neighbors and the output is an update of your feature vectors. You can do this in two steps by basically first aggregating the neighbors and then combining with yourself or doing it in one step. And after that, you take all the node embeddings and you essentially do another kind of aggregation of taking the set of all node vectors and combining them into a joint representation. And so what could this kind of aggregation function be? So here's a simple example. Basically, you take each of the neighbor vectors, you do a nonlinear transformation, meaning, for example, a small neural network, and then you sum them up and you do a small transformation again. And the important thing here is that this is what's called permutation invariant. So basically, different from an image, you do not actually have a natural ordering between your neighbors in general. So basically, you do the same to each neighbor in with whatever order your neighbors are basically in the list of neighbors, it shouldn't matter, you should get the same output, because you cannot distinguish between them. The second thing is that you will want to use the same function same aggregation function for all the nodes. So this aggregation function basically should work for one neighbor, it should work for 10 neighbors and 100 neighbors. So it should be basically also flexible to accommodate a certain number of neighbors. And if you look at my aggregation function here, what you're learning is the f and the phi. So that definitely works because you're just sum over one or you sum over 10, it doesn't matter. So that's the main idea for graph neural networks that you have these aggregation functions that are flexible to the number of inputs and permutation invariant. So now this looks basically like a message passing algorithm, a learnable message passing algorithm. So where is the neural network? Let me just try to illustrate that a little bit more and show you the connection to neural networks. And the way we do this, we'll just unroll these iterations. So let's assume that we want to learn a representation of the node A in this simple graph. So the node A collects information from its neighbors B, C, and D. And it does that via this aggregation function, which I just depict here as a gray box. So that's the thing you're actually learning. So now in the previous iteration, the neighbors also collected information from their neighbors, meaning that B has collected information from A and C, so basically the features from the previous round and aggregated them and likewise the other nodes. So what we get is when we unroll this is essentially this kind of computation tree. And this computation tree is a central part of the graph neural networks and in understanding graph neural networks. And so this looks more like a neural network now where basically you have these different layers. And again, what you're learning is actually these gray boxes, which means they are small neural networks, essentially, these aggregation functions. Okay, so this is um, a, essentially the graph neural network. And what you're really, your training data set is essentially these neighborhoods, these small um, computation trees and predictions for these computation trees. So using that framework, you can just use gradient descent again to train it. What I would like to talk about today is some trying to understand some properties of what these kinds of neural networks can actually learn and how. Um, so when you talk about learning, the first question is what kinds of functions can they even represent? So like if I have the best possible learning algorithm, could I even learn it or not? Is there like, do they have the representational power? 
And the second question is about sample complexity. So we're looking at generalization properties of GNNs. Um, so we look at basically um, norm-based ones and also more structural ones. And then finally, while generalization is typically looking at interpolation within your data set, so basically your test and training data are coming from the same distribution, recently it's also been of interest to basically extrapolate beyond your training data. And I'll tell you like settings where this may actually make sense. Um, and trying to understand the extrapolation behavior of these graph neural networks. So let's start with representational power. And essentially a lot of understanding representational power is basically to reduce the problem to that of distinguishing graphs. Um, the idea is the following that what my network basically does is it takes a graph as an input and it maps it to an embedding to a vector. Now, if I have two different graphs and I map it to the same vector, there's no way I can run a function that has different values for these two graphs. So this is sort of a first way to understand what kinds of functions you can even represent. So let's see what happens here and to sort of think about that, basically for what kinds of graphs do you actually get this collision and for which you do not. Let's try to remember how do we actually represent a graph. So again, we represent a graph by this neighborhood pooling. So basically by a bunch of computation trees, one for each node in the graph that I get via this message passing. So in the very best case, I could distinguish two graphs if they give me a different collection of these computation trees. And then if I do like all the computation right, that basically I can really distinguish um, these two sets, then I'm good. Um, but basically if they already end up with the same collection of computation trees, there's no way I can distinguish the two graphs. So now here, this seems like a fairly rich representation. And in general it is actually, but if you think of graphs that do not have a lot of node information. So here the colors depict sort of the node labels, say the atom information. Graphs like this that are super regular and they do not have any node labels, you get into trouble. So for these two graphs, super um, highly regular graphs, you basically get the same collection of trees, but it's different graphs. So you do fail in some cases, otherwise it would maybe to be too good to be true. And you can quantify this. So basically, the way you can quantify is, this is by comparing it to graph isomorphism tests. So graph isomorphism problem is just a question. I give you two graphs. Can you distinguish whether they are the same or not? So there's a popular test for doing a graph isomorphism, which is not perfect, um, but very well studied, which is the weiss lehman test. And it actually does something very similar to, graph, uh, to the graph neural networks. And essentially what this theorem says is that in the best case, if, or basically whenever a GNN can distinguish two graphs, the weiss fredo lehman test can also do so. And in the best case, you can actually achieve that. And the condition for achieving it is that your aggregation and readout functions are injective. Injective on the multi-set of neighbors that you get, uh, neighbor vectors that you get. So that's basically what it says. So the question is, is this a good result or a bad result? So in some sense, it says, okay, you will have collisions. But on the other hand, the weiss lehman test works actually surprisingly well um, for a large number of graphs. So if you look at sort of the entirety of all the graphs, there's only a small fraction where this actually fails. So in some sense, this is already pretty good. And I'll get back to that. So after this result, there has been, or like, Concurrent to this, there's been a lot of works trying to extend the representational power of graph neural networks, in particular, trying to do higher order networks, so trying to do message passing with essentially larger neighborhoods or taking other types of information into account. Um, so I can't tell you all about these, I'll tell you two examples, um, but I want to also dig a little deeper to the, to the question this discriminative power, does it actually affect any interesting function? So basically being as good as the weiss friedle lehman test is that sort of essentially good enough for all the practical applications we may hear about. So I'll think about this by extending my discussion to two of these recent more powerful models, 
And I'll here just show you the pictures. The first one is port numbering. And the idea of port numbering is that you neighbor basically the edges. For each node, you neighbor, neighbor it, uh, you number its edges. And then you actually can distinguish the edges and the neighbors. And you use that in the message passing that information. And the second one is one where you actually have geometric information. So you use angles between edges, for example, in molecules. And you actually use that also as an additional piece of information. So you can integrate this into the aggregation functions. The actual formulas here are not so important more than the intuition. The question here is like, does it help to some extent? Um, but here is this concrete learning problem. So the question is, can my GNN learn, for example, things like a yes, no question, does my graph have a conjoined cycle? So conjoined cycle basically means I have two cycles that share an edge. Or what is the shortest cycle in the graph? So can it predict things like that? And this is something that is actually very important when you think about computational chemistry, where a lot of the reactive properties of molecules actually depend on these little subgroups, the functional subgroups that you have that are essentially identified by these kinds of little um, motifs or properties. And unfortunately, the answer is not in general. So both the message passing GNNs and the extensions that I showed you in the previous slide, they actually cannot in general learn that. And in fact, the, the re a similar result was proven basically in parallel that they cannot count also motifs. So basically identifying these functional groups will be extremely hard for them. How do you prove that? Um, here's the idea of the proof. Essentially, you take two graphs that say have a different shortest cycle. So the one on the left has three, the one on the right is um, longer. And then you look at their computation graphs. As I said, if you basically the set of computation graphs is the same, then there's no way you can distinguish the graphs. So if uh, purple node B here, Again, the colors are the node features, and you just do the neighborhood, basically this computation tree, the unrolling of the message passing, you see you get exactly the same tree. And the same happens for all the other nodes as well. So this way, you see there's no way you can actually distinguish these two graphs. And hence, you cannot predict a different value for these two graphs. And that's essentially the proof idea. So that's a negative result. And it's sort of an ongoing research um, problem in the community, how to get higher order graph neural networks or more expressive graph neural networks that can learn functions like that. Um, for other problems, the message passing GNNs actually have worked surprising, uh, like really well in many different applications. OK, so this was the bit I wanted to tell you about representational power and distinct discriminative power of graph neural networks. Next, I would like to talk a little bit more about like if the graph neural network can represent a function, how well can it learn? And we'll start with Rademacher-based generalization bounds, and then we'll go on into connecting the structure of the task to the structure of the network. So let's look at how we could possibly prove a generalization bound for graph neural networks. So basically, how many samples they would need to succeed. So the specific model we look at here is one that is also often used in chemistry. So here you see the aggregation operation is, again, a nonlinearity in the sum. And um, we just combine this again with the sum. And the difference, slight difference here is that actually the input, like we always propagate in the combine operation, sorry, we always use the input feature XV. And then we um, basically do a prediction for each of the nodes and we average that to get a prediction for the graph. Okay, so now what we are after is some kind of bound on the expected error on the test set essentially. And there's standard theory a learning theory for doing that or standard techniques so one of them is the bound shown here so basically the probability of making an error in the test set is bounded by the training loss and some quantity which is called the empirical Rademacher complexity 
plus something that shrinks as one over root m with the number of uh, samples m. So what we actually the basically the difficult part is to bound this Rademacher complexity. So what is the Rademacher complexity? Intuitively, it basically says how flexible is your model to fit any kind of possible pattern in your data. So formally, basically, how well can it fit um, arbitrary minus plus labels on your training data points? And to bound this Rademacher complexity, we'll again think about how does the graph neural network actually represent the graph. Again, we do this via this collection of computation trees, one for each node. And that will actually help us reduce sort of the complexity of computing this, uh, this Rademacher complexity. And basically, the way you can get a handle on this is to first realize that you can actually reduce the Rademacher complexity of the entire GNN to just the complexity of prediction predicting from one of these computation trees. So basically, what is the complexity of this computation tree, essentially? And then you get parameters such as the depth of that tree, so basically the number of layers in the network, and the spectral norm of the matrices, um, that you the weight matrices in these small gray neural networks here in the aggregation functions, and actually also the Lipschitz constant of these things. Now, the only thing is that what about these aggregation functions? We have to somehow get a handle on these. And to bound their complexity, we use a theorem that says that basically any kind of aggregation function that I would wish could be written in the following form, the nonlinearity after a sum. And so basically, you apply a nonlinearity to each of the neighbor vectors, you sum them up, and you apply another nonlinearity. And this nonlinearity phi and f are essentially what you're running. So now, given that representation, another parameter you get is the degree, which is basically the number of terms in that sum. So what are the actual bounds you get out? Um, so here is the collection of results, and they depend a little bit on what is called the percolation constant here. So basically, a combination of the spectral norm of the weight matrices and the Lipschitz constants of the nonlinearities. But in general, they basically decay as one of root m with the number of samples. And they depend on the degree of the graph and um, the dimension of the latent dimension r and the network depth l. So OK, so how do these compare to something that's known in the literature? Um, so for example, if you compare them to VC dimension-based bounds that were proved before that, where here, capital N is the size of the full graph, they're typically actually much tighter than those VC bounds. Um, and second, here's a comparison to recent bounds for RNNs. And you see, actually, they look surprisingly similar. The only difference is really the little d, the degree of the graph. So in some sense, you could think of the RNN as a line graph with where basically the tree has branched in factor 1. And the GNN generalizes that to trees with larger branching factor. That's one way to think about this. OK, so we see um, we do get these generalization bounds. And they hold like pretty much for the functions we can represent. Still, empirically, what we observe is actually you get differences on the functions you learn. Um, it works well or less well for different functions. So let me actually make this a bit clear. So now I would like to um, talk about a subclass of problems, um, which are called reasoning tasks, or more broadly, sort of the task of learning an algorithm. And the tasks like that have been considered in the literature are basically as follows that basically I have some kind of collection of items. And I'm asking the network, uh, mostly a relation and question about these co this collection of items. And this could be simple, it could be something like, out of this collection of items, what is the largest value difference in these this collection of items that you can see, or out of these collection of shapes, what are the shapes? about the colors of the shapes that are the furthest away. 
Or it could be something that's more complex that you're actually given this network and you have to predict what is the shortest path in this network from reaching from A to B. So the network is given such a question and typically you learn one network for each question. Um, but really at a more abstract level, what this really is doing is to say that, okay, I have this universe of objects, basically a set of objects. And I assume that I've already done the perception, basically I've already identified the objects and I have an encoding of these objects that's meaningful. And the network has to now just learn basically to answer that relational question between these objects. So how do we do this? And of course, an important part is how do we encode this kind of task? How do we encode this collection of objects that we can reason with it well? And there's be several ideas how you could do this. Let me just show you a few of them. So the first one is to say, okay, I have my collection of items and I'll just do a feed forward neural network. So I just concatenate the representations of these items. I feed it into a simple feed forward neural network. And this network is a universal approximator. It should be able to represent quite a bit. So, Okay, that's sort of a generic idea already. This is a little bit problematic because again, there's no natural order in your objects here. So like in which order you actually put them into the network, it typically matters, it shouldn't matter. Um, for if you just want to do the max versus the min or so it shouldn't matter, but in general it does matter. In NLP. So it's um, the architecture already you see like it'll be hard to learn some things with it. Um, for that reason, in 2017, there's been another architecture proposed, which is called deep set. So that's specifically designed for learning set functions. Um, and the idea is basically the same as for the aggregation functions. Essentially, this entire network is like an aggregation function of in my graph neural network. So for each of the items in your set, for each of the vectors, you apply a feed forward neural network which I call the MLP1 here, you sum their representations up and then you can do further processing. So this is permutation invariant. So it already encodes that this is a set and it doesn't have any order. And finally, another thing that people have tried in the past is graph neural networks. So here, even though you don't really necessarily have a graph, you just do uh, connect everyone with everyone. So you do a complete graph and you run a graph neural network on that. So pictorially, what this is, is essentially you do each node does a pairwise function with all of the other nodes, and then you aggregate that in some way. So the way I write this in the formulas here is that for every node, uh, sorry, for every node S, we do basically a pairwise function on this node's representation with its neighbor, and then we sum that up. Maybe we can have another non-linearity um, that sort of also, yeah, that you can think of that as well. And then we do this for a few rounds and then we aggregate again with something like that, with this sum. So these are the three architectures. And what you can show is that in principle, if I have a permutation invariant function of the sorts that I showed you before. So find the shortest path, these things, in that case, you actually do have an input graph, or find um, the maximum distance between any two objects in my collection. Those kinds of tasks, if I can represent it with one of these networks, I can represent it with the other ones as well. So by approximation power, essentially they are the same, but if you actually try to learn with these networks, you observe big differences. So certain functions are just more easily learned with some of these networks than others. Um, and especially when it, it turns out to um, generalization. So there is actually more to it. And we wanted to get a better formalization of it. Of course, it has to do with some kind of inductive biases, essentially. Um, but can we actually get a better formalization of that um, phenomenon? Okay, so the formalization, I'll show you the actual formalization um, in a bit. Um, we call this the algorithmic alignment. And the idea at a high level is as follows. 
I have my networks and essentially the networks are a skeleton for a computational procedure, like a computation graph, where you could see, say that each of these gray boxes is essentially some re possibly relatively simple function you learn. And now the neural network induces the computation structure among those. Um, and if I can actually represent my task by putting very simple functions in these gray boxes, then it's easy to learn. So if you, for example, think about the shortest path algorithm, you'd have to encode the entire algorithm in this feedforward network. You learn a lot of structure. Um, and maybe some of the other networks can do it better. So in principle, you can do it, but you have to learn a lot about the sparsity of the connections, the invariances, et cetera. And the idea is that if you have this algorithmic alignment that basically um, the task can be answered by putting simple functions into the gray boxes, into the feedforward networks, then we can learn the task easily. And many of these reasoning tasks, they're called reasoning tasks, they're essentially problems of learning an algorithm. So that's the idea. And let's just look at an example. In the paper, we have several examples. I'll show you one of them to kind of illustrate that idea. Um, and I want to illustrate it with the shortest path algorithm. So one way to compute the shortest path is by Bellman-Ford algorithm. You'll be taught in an intro to algos class. Um, so you basically, it's, it's an algorithm and you basically do a for loop and basically in each iteration, for every node, you just compute, you try to update its current best distance to the target. So you basically look at its neighbor and look at if I would go via this neighbor, would I actually get to the target faster? So all you really ever do is you go through the nodes, you look at the distance to the neighbor and the neighbor's best distance, and you combine them and you do the min. So now if you look at actually the computational structure of a graph neural network, it mimics that surprisingly well. Um, if it's deep enough. So in each iteration, you update your nodes, you do the neighbor aggregation. And basically, if the neighbor aggregation is just doing these uh, minimum over the neighbors that you have to do in Bellman Fort, then you essentially can mimic Bellman Fort pretty simply. And the only thing is that the number of GNN iterations, basically the depth of the graph neural network has to be deep enough that you run enough iterations that you actually find that shortest path. So the hypothesis is that GNN actually should be able to learn to mimic this Bellman forward relatively easily because the actual dark purple line here is a pretty simple function. Um, so here are some empirical results. And what we observe here is that essentially that is true. If the graph neural network is deep enough, so the graphs here were relatively small. So basically the diameter was around seven, six or seven. Um, you actually can learn it. Um, and the prediction power is very good. So this is the accuracies. If you do a GNN with fewer layers, you actually don't perform that well. And for the other architectures, if you do an MLP or these deep sets, essentially to encode Bellman forward, you'd have to encode the for loop in one of these gray boxes. And the for loop is a pretty complicated function to encode compared to just the min and the sum. So you like by this hypothesis, you'd not expect it to perform very well and actually they don't really learn that function. And more generally, essentially what you see here is just illustrated with Bellman Ford. Bellman Ford is one um, example of a dynamic programming algorithm. If you have a dynamic programming algorithm of the form that the current state, which is essentially the feature representation of node i in the case iteration is a simple function of the representations of the other nodes, then you can actually learn to represent it pretty well because all you have to learn is you have to learn this DP update in your aggregation function. Um, and this is, and if you look at these recent reasoning tasks in the literature, they are essentially all actually dynamic programs, or they can be computed with dynamic programs. Um, and that is essentially one possible explanation why GNNs have actually been one of the most successful architecture for solving these problems. And that's sort of what people are using these days. So computing the next state of a system 
of interacting objects, computing shortest paths, etc. Of course, there are other tasks. And um, if you sort of expand this algorithmic alignment idea um, to other tasks, such as just minimum and maximum, comparing like the min to the max, um, you get sort of a hierarchy of these tasks. And in this hierarchy or classes of tasks, different architectures perform differently well. So deep sets actually can do things that are essentially just comparing objects at a single level. They can do that, but the, like basically the iterative relational reasoning is going to be hard. And the MLPs, basically the feedforward networks, they do not have any kind of structure and they'll, it's going to be extremely hard to actually learn these kinds of algorithmic tasks just with an MLP, a non-structured um, network. So this is what you observe, what you would hypothesize by this algorithmic alignment idea. This is also what you see in practice actually um, by performance. So can we formalize this idea? Um, okay, it's a little bit shifted. I apologize, this is like one computer to the other. Um, can we formalize this idea a little more? So I gave you sort of a hand wavy explanation with these boxes or modules. Um, so if you want to formalize it, you have to say, what does simple mean? And simple, if basically a box or a module learns a simple function, a simple function is a function you can learn with few samples. So um, the way we formalize this is to say that a network aligns with an algorithm if it can mimic the algorithm by putting simple functions into its um, boxes, its learnable boxes, essentially. Um, and if these functions are easy to learn by easy meaning small number of samples. And learning, learning here means in a pack setting that basically with high probability you're going to predict um, almost correct function value. So, okay, if we have this alignment with some simplifications um, and assumptions, you can show that this actually translates into a learning bound on the full network and the full task. So basically that if you can learn each of these modules well, then you can also learn the full, net, the full task actually well. So this is essentially what this theorem says. Okay, and in fact, like even though there is one kind of uh, relatively big assumption in this theorem is that you have to do it sequentially, the learning, like a layer by layer, essentially, um, there is actually empirical work that follows this kind of learning procedure. So that makes the theorem actually um, more realistic also for practical um, implementations. And we see the same behavior even beyond um, these assumptions. So this idea of algorithmic alignment will also be important for the next part of my talk. So um, we talked about generalization, basically the um, typical generalization that training and test data come from the same distribution. So the network is sort of really interpolating between the test data, uh, the training data that I've seen. Um, and similar ideas will actually be important for extrapolation. So what do I mean by extrapolation with neural networks? And I would like to make this specific for graph neural networks. So in the previous part of my talk, I like in the last part, I mostly talked about learning algorithms, learning something like shortest path, predicting the maximum degree, et cetera, et cetera. Predicting the max difference between all the items that you saw. So what you would hope is that you train your network on say sets of size 10 or graphs of size 10 and it would generalize this if it has really understood the algorithm it would generalize it to graphs of size 100. So basically it would generalize it to graphs of different structure, um, different size, etc. Maybe also different node features. So this is one way you could sensibly talk about like an extrapolation behavior we would like of a neural network and this is essentially the hope. especially also for simulations. Um, now, here's what people have observed in the literature, that in fact, certain GNN architectures do extrapolate to larger graphs. Some of them do and some of them don't. But in general, neural networks are actually bad at extrapolation. In a sense, they are not made for that. That's a known fact. 
So as soon as you go sort of away from the actual training data that you have, they will do something. Some, and that something depends on their architecture. Um, but they, there's no way they can actually know how to basically continue the function that they have seen in your training data. Now, how to basically connect that because these feed forward networks, the MLPs are essentially these little boxes in the aggregation functions of my graph neural network. So they still actually are very relevant to my graph neural network. So how can I sort of make the graph neural network extrapolate better say to graphs of different size? And to understand that, let's first look at the extrapolation behavior of MLPs, and in particular, MLPs with ReLU activation functions. So here is sort of a cartoon picture of what happens. Um, in blue is what my training data is, and it's actually the function I'm learning here is this design function. And the black line is what the neural network predicts. So it's a universal approximator. In my training data, I'm actually basically interpolating it perfectly, I have enough data. But outside of the training data, it's just going to be essentially a linear extrapolation, a piecewise linear extrapolation. Um, and this is what happens also in 2D and in higher D. Essentially, as you go away from your training data, you, it looks like a linear function, sort of this piecewise linear thing that you get from a real. Um, and you can also formalize that basically as you sort of go away from your training data, you pretty quickly approximate essentially a linear function. And you, you converge towards just a piecewise linear function. So essentially what this means is that within my observed data, I can approximate any smooth function. Outside of my training data, I will have basically a piecewise linear extrapolation. So all I can learn is a linear function outside of my data if I have enough information. So what does that mean for my graph neural networks? Again, the ReLUs are, ReLU neural networks are basically these aggregation functions in the network. So let's take a look back at the kinds of tasks we may want to extrapolate. So here again, I take the example of shortest path. Um, and I said, basically, we can mimic the Bellman-Ford algorithm if we can mimic this update that we take the minimum over the neighbor states. Um, with the weights, the cost function. So essentially what we need to learn is the minimum. With um, some aggregation function. Um, so you can, like for, for maximum, for example, you can do soft max, you can mimic uh, the minimum as well. But that is really within your data. Out of your data, for extrapolation, this is going to become a linear function, not a min. So it models, so the here, because our MLP has to model a nonlinear function, it would work, we expect it to work well within my training data, but once you go to extrapolation, this nonlinear function is going to be this piecewise linear function. Um, now, if you actually look at the graph neural network papers where they had success with extrapolating the actual tasks, their aggregations are very task specific. So for example, for this shortest path type algorithms, you would use a min instead of a sum. And once you use a min, what your MLP, the feed forward network actually only has to learn is basically a sum of the states and the weights. And it's really possible it's a linear function. So in the second aggregation function, in the second type of architecture, all your MLP actually ever has to learn is a linear function. And the linear function, we can expect that we may be able to extrapolate it well if all we have to learn is a linear function. And we learned it's a linear function on our data, maybe we can actually extrapolate it. So the difference we would expect is that the upper one, the sum aggregation, both of them would do interpolation well, but the upper one cannot extrapolate and the lower one can. And this is exactly what you see when you run experiments is that interpolation, both of them work. For extrapolation, basically the sum pooling doesn't do it anymore. And connecting it with the previous observation, essentially it won't be able to extrapolate nonlinear functions beyond the data it hasn't seen. So the same also happens for other tasks here. This is for the map 
Um, if you do the pooling such that all you ever have to learn is just a linear function, then you can actually extrapolate well, but otherwise you have trouble. So this is kind of maybe a little bit of a frustrating result, <laughs> but it, it happens because of the basically um, the richness of the function class of these feed forward um, networks. And it's not only the aggregation function that matters. The other thing is that matters is actually the types of graphs you use for training. So if you want to generalize to general graphs, if say you only train on path graphs, you actually will not be able to generalize. So actually the structure of the graphs that you use matters. So what you see here is the errors. Um, when you train on one type of graph and you try to generalize to other types of graphs. Um, so you basically your training set has to be rich enough in terms of the structural properties of the graphs that you'll be able to um, extrapolate. So trying to formalize this, the formalizations here are in the um, using the neural tangent kernel framework. Um, uh, the following sort of results try to formalize that. Um, the first one says that if I do some aggregations, basically I will have to learn nonlinear functions and extrapolate nonlinear functions. I will have a problem with that. Um, I will fail basically if I look at graphs that I haven't seen before. Um, the second one says that, well, if I actually use the right aggregation functions and my training data set is rich enough, that basically I have enough knowledge that I actually learn that linear function, then I can do it. So then I can actually learn the task that I want to learn. Um, so it's sort of both a positive and uh, a negative result. And the, I didn't show the plots here, but essentially the same kinds of observations also hold for not only for looking at graphs with different features, but so looking at different kinds of node features. So looking at different, uh, extrapolating essentially the node features. Okay, so with that, um, I would like to summarize my talk. So I um, told you what are graph neural networks and some of the properties of how graph neural networks can and cannot learn. First, we looked at some of the representational power um, where the important part is to sort of connect it to the problem of distinguishing two graphs. And that tells you a lot about what kinds of functions they can represent or they cannot represent. And second, given the functions they can represent, we looked at generalization bounds um, where it was actually the sort of computational structure of the graph neural network was very important, both in terms of computing general riding river bounds for the trees and in getting more refined bounds and taking the task structure into account. Um, and the task structure and the architectural structure, their interaction also matters a lot when we looked at extrapolation. Um, and trying to basically make these graph neural networks extrapolate, especially for learning algorithms or simulations. So um, these are sort of the initial results. I think there's a lot more open questions in this regard in making these bounds tighter and getting like more general results. Um, but I think it's a very interesting area. So if you want to know more, here are the papers. I put them on the slide and I'm happy to answer any questions.